What's up guys, how's it going? Welcome to Paul's Hardware. This is a quick video about a system that I set up for a very specific purpose. But if you're watching this video, I'm actually not here anymore, or at least not here at home. I have some traveling coming up, and I was thinking, you know, planning the travels and where I'm gonna stay and the things I'm gonna see. I'm very excited. I'm actually gonna be in Europe for a little bit. But I had this thought occur to me, which is, what if I need to benchmark while I'm traveling? So, I've built an emergency portable benchmarking rig. Excellent! The Mastercase H500M by Cooler Master sports dual 200mm addressable RGB fans, a USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type-C port, and four tempered glass side panels, both sides, top, and front. And the front can swap out for a mesh panel if you want maximum airflow. It has a plethora of cable routing covers to keep things tidy too, so click the sponsor link in the description to learn more. So here's the system, it is set up and functional, but I wanted to point out that this video is gonna be pretty lightweight. I'm just gonna kinda of go over the parts and maybe some of the initial testing that I've done because, as mentioned, I'm about to start traveling. In fact, in just a couple hours, I am headed to the airport, so I'm on a bit of a time constraint. I set the system up yesterday though, so let's quickly go over the parts. I wanted the system to be very good at benchmarking graphics cards, so whereas a lot of the builds I've done recently, I have veered towards AMD because I feel they provide you a lot of bang for the buck and a nice balance between CPU performance and gaming performance. If you want to get the most out of a graphics card right now, you're probably going to want to go with Intel's mainstream platform. So to that end, I have a 8700K CPU. In my humble opinion, probably the best CPU for testing graphics cards right now. If you want to get the most performance out of them, perhaps maybe the 8086 would be a good option as well, but if you overclock an 8700K, it's basically the same as an 8086 anyway. To house this processor though and keep everything portable, I wanted mini ITX and I wanted Z370 to enable overclocking and preferably a higher end board to make sure that, you know, I have, have some bells and whistles in there and make sure I can maintain higher clock speeds. So for that, I have the Asus ROG Strix Z370-i gaming motherboard. I've used this board before and it has solid power delivery for some overclocking. It's also got M.2 slots, a couple of them. Uh, it's even got 802.11 AC Wi-Fi which is handy if you need to not have to string an ethernet cable over to your benchmarking setup. For memory, I have a G-Skill Flare X kit, uh, two by 18 gigs, speed 3200 and cast latency 14. And I chose this memory, not because it's actually designed for Ryzen systems, because it is very compatible with Ryzen systems, but I just wanted to maintain the same memory uh, specs, speed, compatibility, and size across all of my testing. And 3200, cast latency 14, I have quite a few kits that support that, that work in lots of different systems, so that's been kind of my standard for memory recently. For storage, we gotta go with an NVMe SSD. So we got a Samsung 960 Pro 512 gig M.2 NVMe SSD in there. Really fast, not quite as fast as the newest 970, but uh, of course it's gonna get the job done. Probably more than enough speed that we need. And I did install this under the little heat sink there to provide a little bit of hopefully extra heat dissipation. I'm not expecting this drive to do any throttling, but if you got a heat sink, you might as well use it. Now for CPU cooling, I wanted to keep this portable, of course, so I didn't really want to haul along an all-in-one liquid cooler or anything like that, although those are very efficient and effective at cooling a CPU, and I probably could have run at a higher frequency. I went with the Noctua NHL12S, which Noctua recently sent over. Somewhat low-profile CPU cooler, depending on where you put the fan, and it does ship with a slim fan, but I found that that was conflicting with the memory, so I was gonna have to move it to the top anyway, so if I'm gonna go ahead and put it on the top, then I might as well upgrade it, so I swapped in the NF-A12X25 PWM, which is pretty much the best cooling fan right now, especially if it's attached to a radiator or a fin stack. I did leave it at the stock RPM settings for the motherboard, so while it is nice and quiet, uh, it wasn't quite enough to keep the CPU cool at all times, but more on that in just a second. I guess I can briefly point out that the little brackets, the little metal brackets that hold the original fan on are actually uh, swappable. So you can use the same brackets to hold the thicker full-size 120 millimeter fan on there. I, just something I noticed that I hadn't done before. So there it is, my entire setup. And I think, I think I should be able to break this down and actually fit it into the motherboard box for travel. But that's not the entire system. I need a power supply. So for these initial tests, I'm using this old school PC power and cooling silencer Mark II 750 watt. This is an 80 plus silver rated power supply, but um, it's been in service for quite some time. And despite the ketchup and mustard cables, it's been doing a fine job, but I'm not planning to bring this with me. Again, maintaining portability means all I wanna bring is that little motherboard box. I'm hoping if I'm on the road, I will be somewhere where I can purchase PC parts. So the things I'm gonna to need to buy if I need to run benchmarks on the road is gonna be a power supply, a monitor, which is the main thing I will probably be a bit of an expense, and then probably a keyboard, because I don't wanna lug around a full-size keyboard as well. 
So that pretty much runs down the hardware except for the graphics cards. And since this is a test bed that's being intended to test graphics cards, I thought, why not do some initial tests here with the fastest graphics cards that are available from both AMD and NVIDIA. So I have the NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1080 Ti right over here. And I have the AMD Radeon Vega 64 right here. These are both aftermarket overclock versions of the cards uh, made by ASUS. So these are both the ASUS ROG Strix versions of these cards. And I've had lots of people come at me when I've done tests in the past and say, why did you choose this card? Why didn't you run it at stock? Why didn't you use the Founders Edition? Why didn't you overclock it as much as it could possibly go? And after doing this for quite some time, here's my philosophy on that. If a graphics card has been out for a while, long enough that third-party add-in board manufacturers have been able to design custom cooling solutions for them, then those add-in board manufacturers have probably also done a little bit of overclocking on the cards themselves. This happens on both NVIDIA and AMD sides. So my opinion is, if you're gonna buy a graphics card, you might be buying an overclocked one, or you might be buying a stock clock one and overclocking it yourself. You should be able, with any stock clock graphics card, to be able to get a little bit of extra performance by overclocking. So, I feel like it's not the best thing to do if you're dealing with a card that's one or two years old to test it at the base lowest settings possible. So an aftermarket card represents a bit of better cooling, it also represents a bit better clock speeds, but not necessarily a crazy high overclock that someone who wasn't into overclocking would not be able to achieve. So that's kind of my middle of the road argument for that. And of course, you are welcome to your opinions as well. So if you disagree, feel free to leave me a comment down in the comment section below. But the test went well, fortunately, I have a pretty decent range of uh, benchmarks that I actually ran on these two cards and I'm not going to share them right now because honestly they've been out for a little while and nothing was too different than what I have seen before in my tests before or tests that I've seen other people do in the past six months to a year. So whether you're talking synthetics, DirectX 12, DirectX 11, uh, both of these cards perform pretty well with the Vega 64 coming in right around the range of a GTX 1080, maybe a little faster, a little slower in certain situations, and the 1080 Ti of course proving that it is still the fastest card currently available. So I guess before I pack things up here, the last thing to mention is the CPU performance. And I did do a touch of an overclock on the CPU. The 8700K will boost to 4.7 gigahertz by default. I put it so it's uh, boosting to 4.8 gigahertz on two cores, 4.7 gigahertz on up to four cores, and then 4.5 gigahertz if it goes all the way up to six cores, uh, because it was actually getting a little too warm. It was getting up in the 90s to mid 90s. It even led to a little bit of throttling in certain situations. And I think that's just because while this is a very good cooler, it's not necessarily necessarily meant for higher end overclocks. Uh, also, just turning up the fan speed would probably have helped there a little bit more, but I was able to get by with those frequencies, especially after the sun went down and things cooled off just a smidge. Uh, so I'm happy with those results for now, but I will say if you are getting an 8700K and you do want to go for a crazy overclock, maybe consider something beefier like the NHD15 or of course an all-in-one liquid cooler would be a great solution there too. So there we have it guys, this is a pretty slim container for a effectively high-end benchmarking system that I've set up here. Of course, not everything is included. I don't have a monitor, I don't have a keyboard, uh, a mouse I'll, I'll be bringing along with my laptop, but uh, of course a power supply. So it's not like I have the entire system here, but I have the fundamentals necessary. And just by adding that monitor, power supply, keyboard, I can load up all the games because they're all stored on the uh, NVMe SSD and I can get up and running and benchmark games while I'm traveling in the Alps or wherever the heck I'm gonna end up going. If you want to find out where I'm actually going, then you should probably follow me on Twitter because that's where I will be posting pictures and also updates on my ongoing journey. So uh, I'll post the link to that in the video description down below. I'll also include links to the parts I've installed in today's emergency portable benchmarking rig. And if you guys are at all excited about the mysterious things that I'm not talking about that I could be talking about that I may be slightly alluding to but not actually mentioning directly, then uh, leave a thumbs up on this video. And of course subscribe because I have more content, mysterious upcoming new content about new stuff that I can't tell you about yet coming very soon. We'll see you guys in the next video. And after doing this for quite some time, here's my philosophy on that. F you. All right, that's my philosophy. F you go f yourself.